And it looks like we're live. We give Chad behind the scenes here a second to add the Facebook group. Looks like we're good to go. Mile high hello, everybody in Broncos country. Welcome into another episode of everybody's favorite podcast of the week from the, at least from what the group chat is saying right here, the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. I'm your host, Lance Sanderson, and joining me as always, my good friend and colleague, he is Mile, huddle, mile High Huddle senior NFL draft analyst, one and only Eric Trickle. Eric, what's going on, man? How are we doing up there in Alaska? Doing pretty good. Fortunately, it's been a little bit warm up here, and uh, we're not having to deal with everything that Texas is going through. And I hope anybody who's watching that is from Texas. I hope you guys are staying safe yeah. and staying warm and everything like that. And uh, just it's nice and refreshing that with the weather that we've had, especially the last couple of days, we've it's been it's been not not as bad as Texas, but it's been not the best weather for up here. Been very cold. Glad to be out of that snap a little bit, and things are starting to warm up. And just been very super nice. This time of year is always really pretty in Alaska. Right. Absolutely love it with the weather, the snow, all that stuff like that. But uh, other than the weather doing good, super excited for the being here as I always am, everything with the draft, super excited with stuff that's going on in outside of here with my, my lightsaber should be here soon. So I'm super <laughs> nice. excited for that. Yes. Uh, and yeah, just, just super excited about a lot of things. And of course it all comes back to the draft. Well, I'll, I'll, obviously and always, this is what we really do here on the Dove Valley Deep Divers is we do discuss the draft with, obviously, Eric being the senior NFL draft analyst for MileHighHuddle.com. Um, we got some really cool stuff coming up for you guys. We uh, we already have our schedule made out all the way up to the draft. And the, the Friday of the draft is going to be on our show. We're, we have everybody on like we did last year. Big, huge draft plans for everybody. We're going to have um, – we're going to plug this here in just a, a few minutes as well. We're going to have uh, one of our Super Chat superstars come on the show. We're going to have a contest about uh, um, being able to come on and do one of the live mock drafts with me and Eric where you guys are the GM. We are the scouting department, and you guys get to make the pick. Um, we're also probably going to have Nick and Carl jump on here to do a mock draft as well. We've got some sleeper picks, a worst-case scenario – podcast coming up here soon so it's gonna be a lot of fun but guys today before we get into this uh we do have to give a shout out to our presenting sponsor manscaped guys 2020 really sucked it was awful we all know 2021 not necessarily off on the right foot but if you want to get it that way the easiest way to do that is embrace that new year and new me mindset with manscaped guys okay manscaped is the best in men's below the waist grooming offering precision engineered tools for your boys and helping 2 million men around the world keep their male grooming on point. Now, guys, if you let yourself get out of hand with 2020 while you're quarantined or doing whatever, if you're locked up and, and can't get out and get yourself in your, in your best place, Manscaped is here for you guys. Now, Eric, speak a little bit about what you got here for Manscaped. Well, I have the thing that they call the shed. It's the carrying bag for it. It actually really comes in handy to keep all your shaving equipment. Really great travel size if you do a lot of traveling and everything. And I also got the Lawnmower 300. It comes in with this nice little bag to help keep things clean. And one of the best things about this is when you go to use it, sometimes the light isn't always the best. But with this, if I can find the power button, it comes with a little light on it so you can see when 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 you're doing your little trimming stuff that you that you got to be doing. And, uh, yeah, it's just a nice little thing. It's very easy to use. The light, again, really comes in handy. The carrying bag, everything they have, they have uh, the, what they call the crop mop. That's very nice for and feeling down there. They have a deodorant. They have a, I can't remember what it's called. It's like a little via, vi, uh, revitalizer type thing. It's a spray that helps freshen things up. Yeah, this and right just, here. Yes, that actually. It's just a bunch of little cool prospects that they are, um, not prospects, Thinking of the draft, it's a bunch of cool different uh, products that they have that just come in handy to keep yourself groomed. Yeah, I I actually have the Shears 2.0. It's a it's a little fingernail clip uh, clipper kit that's got a nail file, some tweezers, and a little nose hair trimmer and whatnot that goes in there. They have the uh, the weed whacker, I believe, is what they call the their nose hair trimmer, um, the, the the electric one that I think also has a light as well. But no, guys, the, the easiest way to get any of this stuff and, and to help yourself out and your wife's gonna love it by the way as well, get yourself cleaned up and whatnot is go to, to manscaped.com. Use the promo code Huddle. You're gonna get twenty percent off and free shipping on anything you get at Manscaped. Again, that's go to manscaped.com, use the promo code HUDDLE for 20% off and free shipping on everything for right now. Your boys and your wife are definitely going to thank you. Happy New Year to everybody out there. Now, guys, today on the show, we have 
some under the radar prospects that the Broncos could be potentially looking at at number nine. We already know the quarterback conversation is ongoing and it has been for months, years, in fact, actually, that the Broncos need to go and upgrade the quarterback position. Um, obviously, this year, cornerback, the, the defensive back position is a, is a big thing. We're, we're talking about Patrick Sertan. We're talking about Caleb Barley all the time, some J.C. Horn references. Eric Stokes as well, potentially the second round prospect. Um, offensive lineman is, is one we're probably going to get here today. Now, Eric, Speaking of those offensive linemen, who do you have at number nine as you're probably not really the deepest sleeper, but a, a big under the radar guy for the Broncos? Well, before we get into this, I want to let everybody know about the little competition we have going on. Yeah, absolutely. about it too for it. So what it is is for everybody who super chats, you guys will enter a drawing over this week and next week. All super chats, everybody who super chats will be entered in the drawing to win a chance to come on to Dove Valley Deep Divers, where we will do a mock draft. Now, what it is, is we always do we every year. I mean, well, every year. Last year, we started doing our mock drafts with you guys to chat as the general managers, taking a consensus on who wants to be the pick. Well, we're the scouting department. Well, in this case, if you win this drawing, um, this random drawing that we're going to be doing, then you get a chance to come on the show and you get to be the general manager. You get to utilize our knowledge, very one-on-two kind of aspect about it. You get to make all the picks based off of your own thoughts or even take inv- advice from us, opinions from us whatever the case may be. So to enter to that, it's just got to be a super chat. Anybody who super chats is entered to win and that it will enter in that chance. And again, it's going to be over this week and next week that you guys have the chance to super chat to enter in. And there's another speaking thing of, I wanted to mention. Well, speaking of super chats, we already got a couple coming in here. So Muhammad, you already know you're in on this one. Like that was one of the first names that was going to come up with a, with a $2 super sticker. Um, I wish we had, uh, Bawana tonight. John is actually unable to attend. He had some stuff going on. So it's just it's a, just us tonight. So we're not going to pull your super sticker, unfortunately. Uh, Mr. Boggins, I've recently linked up with you on Twitter a few times, and it's just great to have you on the show. Uh, hey, why is Tevin Jenkins flying up rankings here lately, Eric? Simple factor is he's really good. I, he's- I've, been a big, I've been a big fan of Tevin Jenkins for a while, uh, ever since watching um, the running back whose name escapes me at the moment. Chubaba. Um, yeah, ever since watching him, he always he's always stood out, and I just really like him. He's got the versatility to play either side of it, versatility to play multiple schemes. Like, just a big fan. He's super good. He's reliable. I don't think his ceiling is super extremely high. But he's one of those guys that if he reach if he develops in certain areas, he can be a guy that you have starting for 10, 15 years, and you are perfectly fine with that. So I think that it's just now that people are starting to catch up. So he's kind of flying up rankings a little bit. But I think in the NFL, he's always been pretty highly highly thought of. Yeah. Um, no, I, I I agree with that. Uh, he's a mauler in the running game. He's absolutely so much fun to watch. I, out on he played right tackle primarily at uh, at Oklahoma State, and he actually is fantastic as a pass protector as well. Um, pretty slept on, honestly, and I don't think that he might crack the first round, the tail end of the first round. Um, and uh, actually, that's a pretty good possibility. But if he's there for the Broncos at number forty overall, that would be a, a, a big direction that I would look like the Broncos to go in, especially with the Juwan James situation. And this is a big part of this conversation leading into tonight as well is what the Broncos do with Juwan James uh, leading up to the draft. They have the opportunity to use a post-June 1st uh, cut on him and split out the dead money hit of his contract over this year and also next year. So it's going to pretty much cut that in half, not quite. It, I'm not exactly sure the full well, number. It keeps him from having a $19 million dead money cap hit this year to only $13 million this year and six and plus six and change next year. Right, so it's which the same is, amount of cap hit. It's just split up over two years. Exactly, and uh, that was that was my bad for wording it incorrectly. I wasn't sure <laughs> if it cut it in half or if there was a if there was an offset on part of that money or not. Yeah. Regardless, now if the Broncos do decide to pull the trigger on that and they need to go out and get an offensive tackle, Eric, options at number nine, man. Well, obviously, everybody that has their attention at number nine, they're talking about Caleb Farley. They're talking about Patrick Sertan. They're talking about Micah Parsons. They're talking about some of these edge rushers like Aziz Ojolari, maybe Quiddy Pay, guys like that. Those are the guys getting all the attention. Now, I'm sitting here, and I'm looking at some of these guys and uh, and looking at Denver, and if and especially with Mike Cousins' report that – or not necessarily report, but his opinion that Jawan James won't be back, it's kind of like, well, if that's the case – and offensive line can kind of become a need here. So I'm looking at two in particular. I'm looking at my guy who I've been super high on for a long time in Rashawn Slater and another guy who I'm really super high on. I actually just recorded part of his uh, Finding Broncos draft profile just before going live on this, actually. And that's Elijah Vera Tucker out of USC. 
I think both of them can play tackle. I think they have the versatility to move inside a guard. I think both of them can play all five spots on your offensive line, though you don't really want them at center just because you're it's the least value to the positions. And they're so good at guard and tackle. So you want them out there where they're where they're better at, I guess, would be the best way to put it. Better value, I guess. That would be the best way. So I'm looking at those two guys. I mean, again, it just comes down to their versatility. It's not just yeah. positional versatility. It's scheme versatility. Yeah. Everybody knows that the Broncos coaching staff might be changed next year, but you still got to work with the scheme that you currently run. So getting scheme versatile guys, that is a big factor for, I'm pretty sure, for George Payton, it's going to be anyways. So getting a guy like Elijah Vera Tucker or Sean Slater who can come in, start at right tackle if Jawan James is out, or even maybe they view Dalton Reisner as the future at right tackle. Well, then here you go. You can put those guys in at left guard. You just have so many options with what you do with it. If injuries happen, you have even more options with what you want to do. And I don't want people to sit there and um, shrug this off because, oh, we just got done seeing a guard to tackle experiment in Elijah Wilkinson. Rashawn Slater and Elijah Vera Tucker have more ability to play tackle than Elijah Wilkinson ever had. His big issue is that his feet are heavy and slow. That's not an issue with Sl with Slater or Vera Tucker. No, Vera Tucker actually played tremendously at left tackle for USC this last year. And Rashawn Slater's played, uh, like you said, all over the offensive line. He's, he played that center position. He played either guard position, right or left tackle. And he's a great athlete. He's a big mover in space. Just mean, nasty out as a run blocker. Really good pass sets. Hand placement is tremendous. He does a really good job of not getting outside the shoulder frame and and or the, the framework of your, of your chest plate, getting outside the shoulders and grabbing and stuff like that. Some of the issues that we saw with, with Garrett Bowles early in his career that he got cleaned up over this last this last season and whatnot um Rashawn Slater is arguably the top offensive lineman in this class and I, I want to say this specifically because there's a distinction that you guys got to understand here Rashawn Slater is not the top pure tackle in the class I think that goes to Penny Sewell but at the same time as a, as far as a full offensive lineman because he, he can play so many different positions the versatility with him is so huge he's going to have my number one ranking at the offensive line the whole all five offensive line positions just because of that um, again Vera Tucker same thing he played in guard moved outside the left tackle held up very well a very good athlete um, I think he needs to work a little bit more on some uh, his hand, hand placement and run blocking and not getting it overextended and leaning too much far forward and getting off balance driving forward vertically but also at the same time he has enough aggression and enough well I, I don't necessarily know how to put this so he's very aggressive but he's also very nuanced and he does a good job of getting angular attack and getting out in front of guys and pushing them down the field but that's the big problem is sometimes he'll get out over his over the top of his heel uh, his toes too much and he'll fall forward and end up on the ground it's not a big issue but it does happen to him now, before I get into mine, I'm going to go say back, uh, get back to the chat here really fast. Uh, Michael DePasqualo coming in here early says uh, Malcolm Brown and Eric are probably drinking buddies since they live up there in Alaska. <laughs> I love that. that was so funny. Uh, that came in right before we went live. I laughed my butt off at that. Um, Gavin Hole, well, what's up, man? How we doing? We got to say, we got to say, hey, give a shout out to Malcolm Brown, the yeah, former, right. Ala the fellow Alaskan here, and, and we're glad that we're our, your favorite pod. I mean, we always appreciate that kind of stuff. Yeah, and as he jumps in here as well, anybody in Texas, buy a generator, guys. Go out there and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and get yourself taken care of. It's, it's awful cold, and uh, we don't want to leave anybody out there in the dark or in the cold. And speaking of leaving somebody out in the dark and in the cold, uh, Garrett Hole jumping in here with a $20 super chat. Thank you for joining us, man. We appreciate that. What up? <laughs> that freaking profile picture. Great. Oh, that, my that's goodness. a good one. Is that a playoff of uh, Gavin? Come back to us on this one. Is that a playoff of uh, Smoking Jay Cutler? Where I just don't care. It, like you got to come back to me on that one. I love it. Uh, <laughs> Muhammad jumping in here with another two dollars super. Great to see you, Muhammad. Great to see everybody in here. We've got the the, the typical usuals like Black Knight joining us tonight. Uh, James Campbell, Robert Kitchens, Jay Kozad, Stephen Beckham. What's going on, guys? Uh, appreciate to have everybody in here joining the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. Now I'm gonna go ahead and go ahead and go into mine. Um, one that I actually did a mock draft earlier today on the draft network um, and, and put that up on my Twitter account at Sanderson MHH guys, go out and check that out. Uh, Joseph Osai, the, the edge defender from the University of Texas. This is a guy that I had um, in our draft primer a few weeks ago uh, where we had everybody join up on, on, on the show. 
and give five of my guys for the Broncos at number nine. Now, the, the thing is here, um, this edge class is really weird because there's not a true elite high profile guy. Um, there's not a Nick Bosa. There's there's not a Miles Garrett. There's there's no one like that in this class. It's going to be a for sure top 10 or top five pick. Um, Osai is one of the guys that I really like. And the reason why is because he's very versatile in what he can do. He He's good, in, he's good with his hand in the dirt. He's good with his hands up as a standing off ball linebacker. Um, he can also uh, drop back into coverage very well in fact in 2019 that 2019 tape he w- he played primarily off ball as a coverage linebacker so he's got that ability and that's something i really like with him um if you're not going to go cornerback or potentially offensive lineman here, obviously the Von Miller situation has to come into this a, a little bit as well because you're probably uh, – yes, edge is definitely a need. If Von Miller's not here, you definitely need to go and address the edge position. I would much rather see the Broncos trade back right here than take Osai at nine. But at the same time, he's a great scheme fit. He's versatile enough to be able to do what Vic Fangio wants him to do. And he's also the perfect fit opposite of Bradley Chubb. Because, yes, it's a 3-4 it's a, it's a, a over scheme where they, you're going to have a, a guy with his hand in the dirt, three down lineman, a, a standing off ball linebacker that needs to be able to uh, – edge defender, I should say, um, that needs to be able to drop into coverage and, and move around as a fluid athlete. Uh, Osai is not the greatest athlete ever, but at the same time, he still has enough coverage ability and the awareness, the mental awareness, understanding his landmarks, getting back into depth and drop backs into coverage that he can actually succeed. And honestly, if Von Miller is still in tow with the Broncos and they still have Bradley Chubb, if they figure out that option with Von Miller, I would play Joseph Osai off ball, uh, like early in his career, because I think that he has the enough ability to be able to do that. Um, Another guy, and I don't necessarily want to just continue to pound the offensive lineman here, is uh, Christian Derisaw from Virginia Tech. This is another absolutely Iron Man offensive lineman. Big, wicked, nasty run blocker. Really good, smooth pass protector as well. Great hand placement. He's actually... Honestly, I would take him over Elijah Vera Tucker just because as a pure tackle prospect, he does a little bit better job of keeping himself on balance. And it's it's a it's a nitpicky thing to me. It's it, it's not like the greatest differentiation. Vera Tucker is going to get that as far like as far as a versatile offensive lineman. But as far as a pure tackle prospect, if you're looking for a pure ta- tackle prospect, Darisaw has it to me just a little bit more than Vera Tucker. Well, I, I don't disagree. I think that as a pure tackle prospect, yeah, because Derisaw is just a pure tackle. Yes, I don't think he. I don't think he has the versatility to move inside. I don't think he has the versatility to play anywhere besides right or left tackle. So you're not wrong there. I just still would take Elijah Vera Tucker because right, no. he's a lot more versatile. Yep. But um, we did get uh, Gavin Hall did come back to us before we get back to it. He said, "Not, I just, hot, not I just found it. That's pretty good, Gavin. You're definitely up there in the top two for my favorite profile picks, along with Base Gase." Yeah. who hopefully jumps in because I every time I just get, get a kick out of it. And CC, welcome. Say finally catching yeah, live. Hope you all are doing great. Hey, we hope you're doing great as well, and we hope you're having a good early. What is it? Spring for me? It's still winter. Uh, whatever you, the season may be, where you are at, we're hoping you have a good one, having a good time, and uh, just getting super excited for the draft as we are. But anyways, for your guys, I think that I, I really like Joseph Osai, and what I'm going to say is going to make it come off like I don't. But my issue for me is that right now, when I went back and watched him just a couple weeks ago, it was, what is he? I don't think he has the traits to be a full-time off-ball. I'm not sure he has the traits to be a full-time edge. He's a hybrid early on. He's that Leonard Floyd type guy. But even then, you still have so much technical work with him. I really wouldn't be surprised if he fell to round two and if he ended up being probably the fifth, sixth, or seventh edge rusher taken. Uh. Because there's just that. there's just there's just so many questions with him with where to play him, what you do with him, all this work that needs to be done. And it's hard because I like him. I'm a big fan of what he brings. I think he's got a really high ceiling. Um, well, not a really high ceiling. I think he's got a pretty high ceiling. And I think his floor is pretty low. I think at the very least, you're getting a very solid rotational player, but that floor is just a matter of is that really something that you're gonna bet on and risk a first round pick on? And then Darisop. To me, he's my number two or my number three offensive tackle. I have Slater as a tackle, and I think that um, outside of Penny Sewell, then it's it's really close between Slater and Darisaw for me. Yeah, and Elijah Vera Tucker, as I mentioned earlier, is I I can see him at tackle, but he's definitely I think he's a guy who's better off inside a little bit, and I think that you'd be kind of stretching for him outside. I think he could do it, but I think again, I think he'd be better inside. So they're both are really good picks, and we have actually had a couple of a. Um, 
comments in here about it. And let me go back. I know somebody asked about Mac Jones early. Michael McCorkle Jones, as we like to call him here on Dove Valley yes. Deep Divers. He and, is uh, I don't think I don't think McCorkle will be an option for Denver at nine. Maybe if they trade down, maybe in the second round. My thing is, is that what we've seen and what we've heard is that the Broncos they either want to upgrade Drew Lock as a starter or update upgrade or upgrade over Drew Lock as a starter or upgrade over Jeff Driscoll as the backup. And if they're not that that upgrade over Lock, they're not going to go all in on it. And I don't think Mac Jones is a clear upgrade over him to where they're going to sit there and be like, yeah, we got to throw our ninth overall pick on him. I don't see it. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe come draft time, McCorkle ends up being the pick. But again, th- I, I just don't see it. I think that if he fell to the second round, they could be like, all right, we could bet on his potential to possibly be a starter. We have the weapons around him who can sit there and make him be solid, help with the issues with his arm strength, help with the issues of his athletic limitations, have him be smarter or ha- upgrade the smartness at the quarterback position. And at the very least, we're upgrading Jeff Driscoll. Although at this point, I think my daughter would be an upgrade over Jeff Driscoll. But uh, <laughs> that's how I'm looking at it there. I do think that the most, and I've seen a lot of this is there as well. Gavin Hole mentioned it. I know Dylan Von Arx mentioned it. I flashed it earlier about a trade down. I don't think Denver's picking at nine. And I don't think it's because they're trading the pick to Deshaun Watson, as another comment said. Uh, I think it's because they're trading down. Uh, yeah. Gut feeling, I just don't think that they're going to be there at nine. Well, it, a big thing with this here is that the this is hard to say because it, every draft has their own quirks and kinks and stuff like that, guys. And you got to understand here, um, there are drafts where there's really good defensive talent, but there's not very very good defensive talent at the top of the draft. Um, this is one of those cases, or there like a, there there might be a very deep offensive tackle class because there's a lot of options, but there's no true first round talents. Um, so go back to like a, a couple of years ago, uh, even to, even to the Garrett Bowles draft, there was really a lot of questions about some of those guys being, you know, uh, first round tackles, Garrett Bowles, Ryan Ramchak, Cam Robinson, and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so this, this class is really weird because there is a lot of high quality defensive talent, but at the same time where the Broncos are picking at at number nine overall. Yeah. You've got Farley, you've got Sertan, but if, uh, it, if you would have put them uh, even a few years ago, I uh, did trying to think off the top of my head of a good one. Uh, regardless, uh, Farley might be like cornerback five in, in some other classes. He's not going to be cornerback one or two like he is this year. It's just the, the talent in, in the defensive aspect is more in the, in the mid rounds. It's, 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 it's hard to project them being those, those guys, especially with the edge class, again, going back to Osai, going to Aziz Ojolari, guys like that. Um, with with the defensive talent being late, towards the later end of the first round, it would not surprise me because the Broncos, yeah, they could take an offensive tackle at nine. They potentially could go out and get a quarterback um, at, at nine if, if that's something that they so choose to do. But if they're going to look for the defensive talent here, I would almost much rather trade back. And there's a there's a question here or a comment here. But let me grab this. Um, and I can't remember who it was from. But uh, Gavin actually coming back in here, he says trade back and get Eric Stokes. Absolutely. Like there's there's no problem with that for me. Uh, trade back, get some more ammo in this class, really rebuild this defense because the defensive class from uh, say 25 overall to like 105, to, to like the top 100, somewhere around in there, that 75 player stretch is where the best premium talent in this defensive class is at. So that to me is the best option. And Eric, I actually do agree with you. Now I'm going to grab one more thing here really fast. Uh, Trevor Sandell jumping in on Facebook. He actually reached out to me the other day and he actually got it right here. Um, he says, I grew up watching Denver with my family. So my, my blood runs orange and blue. I wanted to ask a question. We live in Kansas where the majority are Chiefs fans. Lately, my son Kai has been teased for supporting the Broncos. Would you do a shout out for him? It would make his, it make his year. So absolutely. Kai, Stick in there, buddy. Keep your chin up. The brighter days are on the future. This Broncos team is turning around quickly. It, Trevor, thank you for jumping in. And uh, Like I said, just jump in and we'll shout them out. Absolutely. You guys have a great rest of your weekend. Uh, enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you all for joining us on the, Je- the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. Uh, Chase Choison coming in here on YouTube. Why would we draft a tackle when we have Juwan James? Eric, he added, he, he added a JK. Yeah, oh, JK, yeah, just a few comments later. Okay, <laughs> I, I missed that. I, I apologize for that. I was going to say, wait, we, we kind of just talked about this. Uh, Mr. Boggins jumping in here. Uh, Pokemon evolution chart. Mac Jones is the is the uh, the primary. Uh, this the second the second tier is Daniel Jones and Joe Burrow is is the fully evolved version. I mean, it it makes sense. It definitely it, it's makes sense. Not too far off. Um, really did we get Mr. Boggins's off. super chat? 
No, we haven't yet. I was actually going to. Oh, he came out with the five dollar donation. Thank you, Mister Boggins. We appreciate that. And he says, "I say, I see pay or certain link, certain link to the Broncos at nine consistently. I just wonder how well they would fit in Fangio's scheme." Thoughts? Uh, I'm not going to talk about certain. I've made my thoughts on that well known, and I basically get told to shut up. Um, <laughs> basically, is I know that the Broncos might be looking at making a scheme change, but they still got a draft for what they currently have and try to find scheme versus style players. I don't think either of those guys are scheme versus tell enough for George Payton to be like, all right, this is a guy that can fit now, and he's a guy who can fit multiple schemes early on. I think it limits him what he can look for next year if they do move on from Vic Fangio, and I don't think they fit what Vic Fangio wants to do. I think Pay, or Pay is a strictly 4-3 end, playing that in a three-point stance as that seven technique, and I just don't see that in Denver. And then Sertan, I see as a press man corner, maybe can play a little bit of bail. I don't like his movement to be off. I don't. I think he can mirror well enough, but his click and close, his 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 ability to flip and turn, and I, I just or not flip and turn, his ability to just um, stop on a dime when he's needed. I just don't. I don't. I don't see it in him to fit in an op zone. And again, as the first one I made is neither one of them scheme versus style, which is what what you're looking for first of all in the case of George Payton. Well, and that's a that's a big thing. It, it, we're we're we'll touch into this here in just a second, but that's a big thing with me when I'm looking at players, especially in the draft, is how versatile are they? Can they play in multiple different positions? Can they play in multiple different schemes? Um, can they do pretty much anything that you're asking of them? Because coaching situations are also volatile. And I'm not saying anything about Vic Fangio necessarily. I think the Broncos need to hold on to Vic Fangio because he actually has his team trending in the right direction. I do like Vic Fangio a lot. However, there are questions about whether he's going to be around because the Broncos do have George Payton coming in and there are concerns about the Broncos team right now. And they, there are rumors of there being a playoff mandate for Vic Fangio. He needs to get this team to the playoffs this year. So it's, it's kind of tough. If that does happen to be the case, Vic Fangio runs a very specific scheme skill set or skill set scheme in which his players need to be able to do what he is asking of them. Now, so, the, the, <laughs> real quick, somebody, sorry, somebody pointed this out into the chat and I just got to, point out how funny it is. But Oscar says, why does Google say Eric Stokes is 47 year old? I totally double checked that. I do. It does. And I don't know. I don't know why. Like it's just, it's just funny to me. Like, yeah, it says it's uh, 40, 47 years old. Yeah. We're but gonna, um, we're going to need someone to, to go and fact check that. I think he's 21 <laughs> right now. Honestly. I, think uh, I think he's 21. And uh, real quick, I just want to touch on this a little bit more in depth. Why draft for Vic scheme? Because Vic is someone who's going to be gone next year. First of all, you don't know he's going to be gone. No one does. It's yep. just it's just a likely scenario at this point. And um, the thing is, is that you never want to fire your coach. It's just like you never want to replace your quarterback. You hope every quarterback you draft is going to be the guy. Sometimes they don't. But you want your coach to be successful just as you want your quarterback to be successful. If Vic Fangio was 100% gone next year, he would have been fired this year. There would be no reason to keep him around. Yep. None whatsoever, because you're only hurting the rest of your team if you keep a, keeping a coach that isn't going to be around much longer beyond this year. So you still want him to be successful. So you're still drafting guys that he wants, guys that fit his scheme, guys that can do what he wants them to do. Yep. But as I said, is you want to cover that up with scheme for style players in case you do make that change. Caleb Farley is more scheme versus style, I think, than Patrick Sertan. I think Eric Stokes is more scheme versus style than Patrick Sertan. And it's nothing against Patrick Sertan. I think he's a great prospect. Yeah, no. He's my favorite new corner. I love what he brings. It's just he's stuck into a certain scheme. You want him playing press man, and that's about it. He can play press man, and if he is going to play off, you want him to play cover three because he doesn't have that click and close ability to drive on on drive on routes. So you can have him play that cover three and and get deep and get vertical because he has the athleticism to do it. I mean, at Alabama, they do that a lot. They'll run press man, but then they'll they'll back off and make it look like off man and turn it into a cover three and drop everybody deep. So. To me, that's that's the biggest thing, and like like we were trying to say earlier, you want to have the, those scheme versatile guys because if if you're if you're drafting Sertan who doesn't fit this scheme and you're drafting to look into the future, that that hurts the rest of the club anyways. We we everyone wants to preach this continuity with. I'm going to throw out an example here. Everyone wants to say continuity, continuity, continuity. Drew Locke needs some time to learn and grow within the system. Well. If you're going into this intention with this draft class to not pick anybody that fits Vic Fangio's scheme in the the intention of firing him after this year, where's the continuity there? Like you you have to have that. Like if you want to preach it, 
out one side of your mouth, but then say, well, Vic Fangio is going to get fired this year. You, like you can't have both sides of this coin. It's one or the other. So you, you draft to fit whatever scheme you're potentially going to have. And as Eric as very, very well laid out multiple different times, Sertan is a more specific kind of a scheme fit. Uh, Joseph Osai to me is a versatile guy. He can play and do a lot of different roles. He's not going to be primarily an off ball linebacker. He's not going to be a guy with his hand in the dirt. He's not going to be a standing wide nine edge defender. He can do all of those things. So that's, to me, what gives him a bump over someone like an Aziz Ojolari, who I think is versatile enough to do all that stuff too. He's just not great in coverage right yet. And he's still got some time to develop on that. But versatility is huge, especially in any prospect evaluation. You have to be able to be versatile and move within the scheme because, again, coaching uh, coaching schemes and, and coaching situations are extremely volatile. It can dry, end at the drop of the hat. I mean, Bill O'Brien's not exactly the greatest example here, but he went to the playoffs and won the division four years in a row and got fired this last year because he was terrible. Like, And now you've got a, a bad roster that has no direction because what is the scheme? There's no scheme there. There was all specific scheme fit players, and now you have to try to figure out a way to work around that, and that's another big reason why Deshaun Watson really wants out of there is because there's no direction there at all. So it, keep that in mind, guys. When we talk about uh, the versatility with, with players and prospects, you have to understand that there's there's a bigger picture here as well. It's not just for this year. And it's not just for the future. There is there is some of both in that as well. And I wanted to grab this comment earlier. Um, Mr. Boggan said, I said trade down during the round table and none of you had my back. Uh, I don't remember much of the round table. That was too long ago, and it was a long and – Lance ranted and raved and kind of like spent about 10 minutes of the podcast just talking. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> anyways, um, yeah, at the time, like just a little while ago, I was very much on don't trade down, kind of stay put. But the more when I go back, so I have a process when it comes to scouting, and I always go back and watch guys just another game or two. And sometimes my opinions will change a little bit. I was very big on Caleb Farley, on um, different edge rushers at nine. And but more I watch, the more it came and watching that extra game, it's like I'm not really sure if nine's the best value for them. I think trading down is. I really like the idea of trading down to 20 to 25, getting Eric Stokes and uh and seeing what happens, getting an edge rusher with your second pick. Um, which leads me to another thing. So yeah, I've definitely come around on trading down. Um, it's just the NFL, one thing with opinions, information, things like that. NFL stands for not for long. Things always change. Things are always fluid. Yep. And then about the um, edge, Andrew Switzer came in and said, I know edge may not be a huge need. To me, it is. Um, yep. But what does everyone think of Jason Oway? I love him. Yep. Um, he's one of my draft crushes. He's an athletic freak. He made Bruce Feldman's freak list. Supposedly runs a 4 3 40 at 260 pounds and 6 foot 5. Um, I'd love to see the video of that and see the confirmation of that, see if it's actually true. But if he is that big, that athletic, that big of a freak, man, he could do a lot of things for him with on your defense. I think it's a huge need because Malik Reed is a free agent after this season. Bradley Chubb, you have to make a decision on his fifth-year option. And Von Miller, Denver wants – words coming out that Denver wants to try to extend him. They want they don't want to back at his current cost. They want to lower the cost and ex, by extending him, or they may not pick up the option or move him in other ways, like a trade or something like that, is – you got to find edge. You got to find edge help. That is, I think that this, this year's Super Bowl showed that if you want your best chance to slow down Patrick Mahomes, you got to be reliable at coverage, but you got to get the pressure up front with as few pass rushers as possible. Yes, absolutely. And another thing to add on to that there is the fact that Jeremiah Tauchi was on a one-year deal this year. So you have three guys that have uh, that have questions as far as their future and a fourth guy that's not even under contract, at edge defender. So you have to pick up at least somebody. In this class, uh, there's a lot of really quality guys. you got Shaka Tony, uh, Quincy Roche out of out of Miami. Um, you've got William Bradley King out of Duke. He's going to be a guy to, to later rounds. You can draft and develop him. Um, again, the top-end guys, Osai Ojolari, um, you've got um Gregory Rousseau so Eric here's another question I saw from from somebody in here was would you rather draft Joseph Osai at number nine overall or would you rather take Gregory Rousseau Ooh, at number nine overall I'd yeah, actually probably nine. I'd probably take Gregory Russo over Joseph Osai just because he has such a high ceiling yeah like I mean he's got such a low floor but that boomer bust aspect of it it's a huge risk but it's a risk I'd be willing to take obviously neither is ideal for me but, uh, yeah, for edge rusher, for a guy who can get after the quarterback the way he does, as athletically gifted as he is, as well as he uses his length, I think that, yeah, he would be a really good fit. I think that he can come in and compete right away and provide Denver um, the help that they need. And Chase Wallner came in asking, 
with a $5 donation saying, would it be a reach to draft any corner other than Farley at nine? Uh, as I was just kind of talking about, I think it'd be kind of reach to draft Farley at nine even. Um, none of these corners for me are top 10 players. Yep. Um, I don't think that I haven't really settled my board yet. Just going by my grades off the top of my head. I don't think Farley actually falls in my top 15 even. I think he falls like right around 17 or 18. Um, but I definitely got to get that sorted and situated. Um, yeah, it, other than him, it, it would be – I, I could live with it depending on what else they do in the draft, what else they do in free agency. But yeah, any other corner would definitely be a reach. Um, Patrick, Patrick Sertan, if it wasn't at number nine, if Denver traded down and still managed to get him, I'd live with it because then you can sit there. It's not as high of a value placed on him. And so the the risk is a little bit mitigated because it's not as high of a draft pick. Um, Eric Stokes, again, I mentioned earlier about trading down to 20 to 25, maybe a little bit lower than that. Um, and then other than that, I'd be looking at second round for corners. Right. Uh, Joey Badass coming in here on Twitch and uh, got to shout out all of our, our beautiful Twitch viewers that come in every single night. Thank you. Thank you, Joey, for joining the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. Uh, not picking at nine is a mistake. If we don't get a veteran corner at all, we will have no one but Callahan as the only true starter. We need a cornerback way more than any other position. And as Eric just kind of got done lining out there, Eric Stokes is a guy that actually can be a legit starting cornerback and he can play inside and outside. This is another one of those guys that's scheme versatile. He can play inside. He's position versatile as well. He's got good length, great athleticism. He's a good in a press. He's better off the ball, I think. He's got great hip fluidity. He can drop back in, in, uh, in, a, in a back pedal. He can turn and turn and run with guys. Eric Stokes is definitely an option. You don't have to pick him at nine, though. And you can drop back to the, to the 19, 20, 21, 22, somewhere around in that area and feel really good about taking an Eric Stokes. And, again, if Vic Fangio is, is gone after, this, uh, after the 2021 season – Eric Stokes can play in man. He can play in off zone. He can play press. He can he can do pretty much anything you want him to do. That's a guy that can be a starter. Now, as far as a veteran quarterback option goes, um, there's a couple out there right now. There's um, you've got uh, Kevin Johnson from Cleveland is an option there. You've got William Jackson the third from Cincinnati. He's a really good option there. Um, the pipe dream one that I don't think necessarily is the greatest idea. Maybe you can get him for a year and then flip him over to a safety if you got him like on a three year deal would be a Patrick Peterson. Is what you would do with Patrick? Sorry to interrupt. But what you would do with Patrick Peterson is you'd cut bait with Kareem Jackson, sign Patrick Peterson, and put him in Kareem Jackson's role. Yeah, and then you draft Richie Grant to put behind him to learn because that's exactly what you need him to do. Uh, no, it's it, like there's 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 multiple different ways to skin a cat, guys. I, I, that's a that's a, I don't know if that's a Wyoming saying or if there's somebody else. That's, there are multiple ways to skin a cat. It's not only one direct option. And drafting a, a cornerback at nine, yeah, it makes you feel good on the inside. But if he's not really a num uh, the number nine overall pick, if he's not a top ten player, that might be considered a reach. However, as I was trying to lay out earlier for you guys. This defensive class, the meat of it is actually like the better value for the for the cornerbacks is from 20 to like 45. That area right around in there. You got Greg Newsom out of out of Northwestern, who's a great pro, uh, a great prospect, good scheme fit as well. I like him a lot. Um, you, uh, maybe going back a little bit further than that, uh, I don't think that Asante Samuel Jr. from uh, Florida State's a, a scheme fit, but I like the player. Um, you've got a Tyson Campbell from Georgia as well. There's a, there's a, there's multiple different players at the cornerback position you can get later down the road in this draft and still feel good about them stepping in and being a day one starter. And let's not sleep on Michael Ojemudia either, guys. Like it, he's still exists you've got a saying bassy who's going to come back from that torn acl bryce callahan is probably the question mark there really but i mean you need a veteran cornerback and you need a, a legit draft option and if you get him on the first two days you're going to get a, a high quality player it just doesn't have to be at number nine overall so i just want to say real quick the saying up here is there's more than one way to skin a polar bear just do it before it skins you Yes, do it before it skins you, as always. Speaking Malcolm of Brown. Alaska, Malcolm yeah. Brown came in with a $5 donation saying, which teams have offensive systems similar to Shermer's and will be competing for the same type of players? Um, these type of questions are always interesting because, because opinions around the NFL change. Yeah, And that's one thing that, while I may not like Patrick Sertan as a, uh, Sertan as a scheme fit for Denver, Denver might. How teams view what fits their scheme varies. So even if there are other teams, and there are plenty of teams out there that run the similar inside zone running game with a spacing game as a spacing passing game that likes to attack deep a little bit, there's a lot of teams that like to run that. It's a, it's not, I don't want to say it's a simple, but it's a common type of offense. Bruce um, Arians. Yeah, Bruce Arians is like that. Like, there's just so many of them. Um, but what may not be what scheme fit to one guy, maybe to another. 
um, even though their systems are pretty much the same, just because they value trades differently. Yep. Um, and like for one thing for me, and we actually typically before we go live, we're we sit around, we watch a little bit of tape together. And uh, so today we were watching corners, and there's one corner that I absolutely loved, and it's Elijah Molden out of Washington because even when the play is on the opposite side of the field, he's always running basically full speed to go make a play. Then we watch another corner who he just kind of would jog around. Now, if they both fit the same scheme, I may gravitate. I may be gravitate more towards the one because hey, he's always going full head on into the run, even when it's against them. Whereas Lance or someone else who with another team may go for the other guy because of a different trait uh, that he has that they just prefer. So it's always hard to say who's competing for the same type of players. I think the easiest ones to do are anybody that runs an outside zone. They're looking for smaller, more athletic, technical or technicians on the offensive line. That's probably yeah. the easiest one to say that that's going to be what they're looking for. Right. So, uh, so for an example here, um, Mark, the, uh, sorry, <laughs> for an example here, uh, you've got uh, um, Deontay Brown for the, the offensive guard for the Alabama, Alabama Crimson Tide. He's a, for a guy his size, he actually moves very well, but he's more of a power running runner guy because he's a mauler. He's, he works so well in a phone booth. He can move around and, and pull. He does a really good job pulling, but he's not a lateral movement guy. He's more str- like, I'm going to drop a hip and then turn and run. He's not a lateral movement guy technician with his hands, stuff like that. He's a mauler in the running game. So he's not going to fit that outside zone running scheme more or less. Yeah, th- He probably can do it, but just for an example, that's not his best trait. His best trait is to drive forward vertically and get into somebody's face and just beat the hell out of them. And that's, that's what he's going to do the best. So you're going to look for a team like, let's go back to the Oakland Raiders circa uh, 2007, where they had Darren McFadden and they were running straight power game. That's what, that's the kind of offensive lineman you want for him. Um, Now for another example of a smaller, more shifty offensive lineman, uh, let's see here, like a a Chris Cooper would actually be a good example of a former Bronco. That's a a guy that can run the the outside zone. Dalton Reiser can run outside zone because he's got enough athleticism to be able to do that, to move laterally and still be able to work with his hands and, and create those kind of running lane angles by using more technique than just straight power. There, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. And specifically to the offensive side, you can make a wide receiver. This is going to seem kind of hot takey and really dumb, but at the same time, you can uh, wide receivers run routes. You, you might want a certain specific kind of a guy. You might need an X receiver or a Z receiver, a slot receiver, something like that. To uh, You need a quick jitterbug kind of a guy to, to run quick slant routes. You can find those guys all over the place. It's wide receiver schemes are and passing concepts, they're all relatively the same. Do you want more scheme fits on the, the interior of the offensive lineman? And then for coverage schemes is the biggest thing. Those are the real with, big differences there. With wide receivers, you're not so much looking for scheme fits. You're looking, you're looking for, for complementary skill sets. A yep. um, couple questions here that I wanted to grab real quick. Um, uh, Kevin Hall asked about what your guys' thoughts on the edge from Oklahoma. Ronnie Perkins, I like him. I've heard there's some off-field stuff that's kind of questioning. I think second round is probably not to quite top 50, but top 75, so 50 to 75, 50 to 80, somewhere around there. Um, Nick Kendall actually had a tweet on that that I think he said 50, 50 to 85, I think is what he put. Yeah, I'd be yeah. fine with that. And Spencer Monroe comes and says, I want us to draft White Hubert if he drops to the third or fourth round. He will be a beast. Um, a beast with T-Rex arm. If he, could, if he could stretch out his arms about an extra to four inches. Um, you just don't see successes in the NFL at an edge as an edge rusher with 30-inch arms. No, um, it just doesn't happen. It's hard to be successful. Uh, I don't. If he's there in the fourth or fifth round, I wouldn't take him. I wouldn't touch him in the draft personally. I might take a shot as an undrafted free agent, but he's got a motor. But you got to have that length for it. At yeah. some point, length does become an issue. Um, I saw a question about Levi uh, I, on Reiki. I, I think I don't know how to say his name out of Washington. Um, yeah, Todd Ostendorf has it. He says he really likes him. Um, I like him, just not for Denver. I think that he's more of a traditional 4-3-3 tech um, that can just shoot up the middle and get quick pressures. Don't like him that much against the run, though. No, I, I agree with you. He's a, he's a one-gap penetrator, and you need to have some two-gap ability to play in Vic Fangio's scheme on the defensive line, especially at the three-tech position. Like You you want a good five-tech that can be a, a like a Shelby Harris, for example, um, a guy that is a, a, a good one-gap penetrator, but you need a, a zero-tech nose tackle like a Mike Purcell that can that can be a penetrator but also has enough ass in his, in his game to – 
to sit there and hold the point of attack in two gaps. That means you're you're holding on to a guy in front of you and you have both gaps on either side of him. That's a two gap player. Uh, a one gap player is a guy that's going to shoot around off of one one shoulder and and plug that single gap. Anuzrike is more of that single gap kind of a player. He just doesn't necessarily quite fit here. I do like the player though. That's a, that's another thing. I understand where you're coming from and he would be a great addition if he had some more versatility to play that five technique and to play that that interior pass rusher role with absolutely he potentially could there's there's no doubt that he has the ability to do that just not not quite there now this next comment here from paul uh super chat here uh thank you that for that paul uh, one of the biggest fans of the show that paul's been around for a long time over a year now uh i can see peyton keeping vic to finish uh, the contract due to ownership flux and money unless the wheels fall off Trade down to number 22 is the number one goal. Um, not sure off the top of my head who has the number 22 overall pick. Um, you're probably going to get um, a very similar haul, maybe a little bit more than what the Broncos got in the Noah Fant trade. So going back to 2019, where they dropped from number 10 to number 20 and got a first, a third and a future third, I think is what they got from Pittsburgh and where they took Noah Fant there. Um, I would really hope that the Broncos could get a, a future first round pick in that and then potentially make um, some big waves if they don't go in the quarterback market this year. You have two first round picks next year, depending on how uh, Drew Locke plays. And if he does take that next step or whatever veteran hedge competition comes in, um, you can go all in on like a Sam Howell out of North Carolina, um, Spencer Rattler, maybe out of Oklahoma. I do like the idea, um, the, the trade down. I, uh, again, we were talking about this. The, the better part of the defensive class starts around that 20 to 25 area anyways. That's where the value is, guys. So it's a, a valuation or valuation. So how do you evaluate a player and how do you value them? You evaluate the player by what he can do. What value does he have? Benjamin Albright is uh, pounding this right now. The value of this defensive class is 25 to about 75, 80, 90, maybe even 100. So that's that's about where you want to be looking at for the defensive players. And I, I agree with that. Trade down. Um, let's see here. Let me grab another couple of comments. I just want to say about Spencer Rather, no thanks. Like, <laughs> just no thanks. Like he makes, he's like Johnny Manziel on steroids, but without the drug issues. Like just a, I've heard nothing but bad things about him dealing with him and a person, his personality. Um, I'm not super high on next year's quarterback class, anyways. Um, Desmond Ritter, he's QB one. Yeah, I know you've been on Desmond Ritter for the longest time. Big, tall, good athlete, had really and, good arm talent. Man, he's so much fun to watch throw the ball. And it's around. not like he's a great prospect either. It's just. I'm not a big fan of Sam Howell. I think he's I think he's an all right prospect. I don't see a guy when I watch him, I don't see a guy who's gonna be great in the NFL. I don't like Kadon Slovis. I don't like Spencer Rather. I like him on the field, but off the field, no way. Um, I'm trying to think of other names out there. I know there's another guy, um, Brock Purdy, but he's a late round guy. I, I mean, obviously things can change, but it's just based off what it, what I've seen now. JG Daniels, he's another one. I do like him. Um, right. but there's a lot of these guys that's gonna depend on what have, what they do this next season. Um, there was one other comment here that I wanted to get real quick, but the chat kind of yeah, moved the, on me quite yeah, a bit, and I can't remember. Really big. I, I did have one really fast that I wanted to grab if I can get back to where it was at, and it was actually from Nasruddin Dies here, and he has thoughts on our Darius Washington. He went nuts in the chat here, guys. Nasruddin has been joining us for a long time. Thank you for joining us once again, guys. Um, our Darius Washington from TCU, his teammate Trevon Morig is really – I have Richie Grant as safety one in this class just because – that's my dude. That's my guy. We stand Grant in this household. Uh, but uh, Trevon Morig has equal scheme versatility. I like him better as a single high free safety than more of a uh, middle of the field open cover two kind of a guy because I really value his athleticism and his range and his ability to run sideline to sideline at the deep safety position. And also, I love the fact that he is a great high quality punt returner. Our Darius Washington, though, um, there's a lot of people that are talking about our Darius Washington as uh, what. Uh, What's his name? Uh, uh, Tyron Matthew. 
kind of a clone. He's a, a guy that lines up all over the defensive scheme. He can play deep. He can play in the slot. He can play on the outside. Physical guy, a little bit smaller, but at the same time, he does very good with his technique and tackling, very aggressive, great angular attack, very good awareness. This guy is actually really fun to watch. Um, there was another couple of them here as well. And Eric, I'll let you grab. Um, if I know he had uh, Hamzan Nazaril Dean. And there was another. Oh, uh, Andre Cisco from Syracuse. Um, Hamza Nasser Aldean, I think he's got some scheme versatility. I think it would be a lot better if he was more consistent with his reads. Um, he seems to have some solid range, but it just it's hard to gauge really because he can be so late with his reads. And then Andre Cisco, I like him as a cover two guy, splitting the um, splitting the field deep. Basically doing what Fangio does. I like him in multiple roles of that. Not a guy you want down in the box. That's about the only role he can't really fill. Uh, I like him. I wish that he didn't get hurt this year, though. Yeah. The the torn ACL. I, I, was that this year or was that last year? I, I thought I it was this that, year. I can't remember if it was this year or last year. Um, Cop 16 to pull this one up here, jumping in on YouTube. What about Parnell Motley? He played good versus the Chargers. Eric, what do you he think? He did, but he's – He's a guy who's fifth or sixth on the depth chart, and you can't really bet on that. It's like last year. I know yep. a lot of fans wanted Denver to bet on Deshaun Hamilton making a huge leap just because of a few games to end the season with the last five games that he had, or last two games that he had with Drew Locke, and Denver goes out and takes two receivers, first and second. Um, you, you just can't bet on huge progressions at certain players. Uh, he was undrafted for a reason. There's not saying there's not potential with him, but he's not a guy you bet on. Yeah. Uh, no, I agree with that, and that was that was a big reason as to why Vic Fangio had to kind of change some things up for the defensive scheme, uh, especially later down the end of the season where they went to more two-man than the, that straight oh. match quarters and cover four. Um, it was because the injuries at cornerback, and you're playing with guys like Parnell Motley out of Elijah Holder, who why the hell is he playing at the cornerback position? Um, Kevin Tolliver got some playing time in there as well. I mean, it was just it, – it's it's bad it, to, to have cornerback depth that bad, and that's why the Broncos need to have some more cornerbacks. And I understand, you know um, – Joey on Twitch coming in here and saying, you know, we need to have a veteran cornerback and you got to have another starter in the in in the draft as well. Yeah, absolutely. You definitely need to. You can't count on Bryce Callahan to play 16 games. And Isang Bassi, even though he played very well in the slot and actually took the job from Michael Ojemudia as far as kicking him off the field, moving Bryce Callahan to the outside because Essang Bassi was playing so well in the slot and Ojemudia was struggling, especially as a tackler. Like you got to build some more depth. Like it's it, it's very obvious that the Broncos need to go in and get some more depth. And Parnell Motley could be a part of that as a developmental guy and a special teams player, but I don't want him on the field all the time. I can tell you that right now. And just throw this out there, you are correct. He did injure it, not the not 2020, 2019. And then he opted out for 2020. That's why I got, uh, my, I got my ears mixed up with uh, Andre Cisco. Uh, well, this uh, year came in, wild. said, don't draft injured players, Jake. But um, it's a lot more to it than that. It's not as there black is. and white. It needs a lot more nuance to it. And a lot will depend on what happens with the medical exams. With Jake Butt, everybody knew that he was going to be um, – have that red shirt year the first year but nobody knew that he was going to have all those injuries come back um it's a risk that you take them that's why you ne negate that risk by using a fifth or sixth round pick on some of these guys yeah. guys who get cleared medically and everything like that that there's no signs of lingering damage that there's no concerns going forward they still go early and a lot of them end up failing because of injuries other ones they end up going on and having good careers it's not as black and white as saying oh this player is hurt so he's going to be a fail it's just like saying um, just because so-and-so player only has 23 starts means he's going to fail. It's not that black and white. Each right. player is an individual. Each prospect's an individual. And there's a lot of other variable factors into it as well. well. And to, to kind of piggyback off of this really fast, uh, don't draft injured players. Well, why don't you tell that to the Cleveland? And I understand where you're coming from here, RC. I really do. But why don't you tell that to the Cleveland Browns who took Nick Chubb coming off of one of the worst knee injuries we've ever seen? And he's a superstar in this league, and he's playing football at an insanely high level. Now, Jake Butt, to, to go back to this a little bit, um, Jake Butt, <laughs> when he was at Michigan, was widely considered, if not the, uh, the, the top tight end prospect in that draft class, a top two or three. Like He was considered a first-round player. And the, the the torn ACL and the Fiesta Bowl that dropped him down, and obviously you know you have to, to worry about that. But you're, there's a there's a point where your evaluation of the player and the valuation and how you value that player meets up. 
And it, you're going to eventually cross that path. You're going to hit that one point. And for the Broncos, you have a first round talent sitting there in the fifth round that's coming off of a torn ACL. So there's injury concerns there. If he comes back healthy and he can play at that first round talent level, you now have an extremely good steal. And I mean, people have that happen all the time. It's, it's not, uh, as Eric said, it's not black and white. There is some more nuance you have to understand with this. It is a great point. It is a great point that you need to not necessarily don't draft them, but also at the same time, take that into your evaluation and understand that there could be some lingering effects some long-term effects from the injuries that he definitely does have. So it's a great point. I see where you're coming from. Open up up a little bit more. And uh, before I get to this next comment, I want to say is I just want to mention the fact that I, I totally see you guys talking about Patrick in the chat and man, you guys are speaking straight to our hearts right here. Because we have long out of the fact that we don't think that Tim Patrick will be back. No. Um, that yeah. it makes sense for Denver to move on from him. So we it's nice to see all that. But I, I gotta grab this comment. K Hop 16. What do you guys think about what Cowherd said about Drew Locke? Um I have no words that I can say live without getting in trouble to express how stupid what Cowherd said was. Going off, there's plenty of reasons to not be supportive of Drew Locke to have your doubts about him. But him being too cool for school or whatever it was he said, yeah, that ain't it, dog. The the for those of you that are not watching the show live tonight that are going to listen to this after the fact as a podcast. First off, thank you once again for for joining in with us. You didn't see me literally like rubbing my face in my hands. This was such an abomination of a take. Um, too cool. Um, too calm, not urgent enough. That like that doesn't actually hold water when you watch Drew Lock because sometimes there seems to be a little bit too much urgency and he presses a little bit too much. Um, I don't necessarily understand where he got this take. I think it's the rebuttal of his take that Drew Lock was going to play at a MVP caliber level this season or was going to be the next second year quarterback to win the MVP or something like that. That what he said in like April of last year, May of last year, something like whatever it was, it's got to be that stark contrast to him. And to put it nicely, Colin Cowherd is a Colin cow turd. Let's just, let's just put it that exactly as, as chase coming in here. Thank you for saying it there even more nicely. Colin Cowherd just says things for views. And uh, th- I'm not going to go any further on that because I want to uh, say hello to – we got a Facebook user here. I'm not exactly sure who this is. I'll come back and see if I can find it in the in the Facebook stream on the, the Mile High Huddle face up gr- uh, Facebook group. Um, uh, for some reason, your um, name doesn't pop up on our side, and we can't see exactly who you are. So he says smash that like button and share. We appreciate that. Um, love the show, guys, as well. He jumps in there as, uh, to, to finish that out. Um, so let's see here. A couple more. There minutes. was Got one more. There was one more comment here. Robert Kitchen said, "Patrick and Bowles were the best players on our offense last year. Why let Patrick go?" Well, first of all, Patrick is 27 years old and will be 28 in November, and so the odds of him continuing this up beyond a, another two, three years is unlikely. And he's a restricted free agent. You can slap a second round tender on him, 2.4 million, something like that, um, against the cap for him if Denver can't move on from him. And then dangle him on the trade market, get an extra pick. I don't think a team will sign him away and give up a second round pick, but I think you can get a third round pick for him. This is a team that they're pretty loaded at wide receiver. They have Cortland Sutton coming back. And so you got to figure out something there to unclog your clogged things that you're with your top three wide receivers. Yeah. You want KJ Hamler on the field. You want Jerry Judy on the field. You want Colton Sutton on the field. Tim Patrick there, he just kind of clogs that up. You want to better your fifth and your fifth, your fourth and fifth spot with, with over Deshaun Hamilton. Hope Tyree Cleveland steps up a little bit. So that's where you look at a day three wide receiver. Now the biggest thing for this is who you if Tim Patrick is kept beyond this year, who are you keeping, Cortlin Sutton or Tim Patrick? Because they're both unrestricted free agents next year. And the another thing that you actually mentioned earlier when I was talking about how scheme fits and, and stuff like that don't necessarily apply to the wide receiver position. You're looking more for complementary skill sets. Uh, Cortland Sutton and Tim Patrick are almost exactly the same player. Like they have very similar skill sets here. Um, now, it, again, it does go back to which one would you rather keep. And obviously, Cortland Sutton coming off of that torn ACL. Uh, Tim Patrick had a breakout year last year and is widely considered one of the best second wide receivers in this, in uh, like uh, as an available option on the open market this year, potentially if he does hit that. Um, so 
you need to have that added extra versatility where you can get a KJ Hamler who brings that speed dynamic threat that can stretch the field vertically and horizontally. You've got to have a high quality route runner in the, the Jerry and Judy as well. Cortland Sutton could be your deep ball threat as far as a one-on-one -on -one option in jump ball situations. Like what are the complementary skill sets that you can add to that? Now, Patrick actually really developed as a route runner and I'm not going to take anything away from what he did this last year, but Cortland Sutton did as well. He was a really high quality route runner in year two. This last year, it really kind of sucked. But at the same time, if you can get uh, a, somebody else, it, and not that he's real a realistic option, but if you can get a Jalen Waddle who also has a great route running ability and to, like stretch the field vertically, I'm all for it. I, like I, I really am. Like that's another complementary skill set that you can get there. Um, and just with with a, with a Obviously, we're keeping Sutton over Patrick. That's not even a question. Uh, well, that's, that's the point. That's the point that we we're trying to make is if they're both hitting free agency at the same time, you don't want that. You want to try to recoup something for Patrick, who he was an undrafted free agent. Yep. So if you, now you got to strike here where the when the iron is hot in this case, not when they're both about to hit free agency because what leverage you have, you lose. Yep. Now is the time that you move on from Tim Patrick. And it's nothing against Tim Patrick. I like him. He's done a lot for the Broncos over the last couple of years. It's nothing against him, but this isn't the NFL. That doesn't mean the National Fandom League. It's the National Football League, and it's a business. Yep. You've got to look at it from a business aspect of it. Yeah, no, and, and guys, you, you guys are bringing up some really great points. I understand exactly where you're coming from. I, I, I get it. It's it, it is hard to see some some guys. There you go, Mr. Boggins. Uh, I'm all for it. Get Kyle Pitts <laughs> at that point. I mean, sure, absolutely. Now, spoiler alert, guys. I already have built up the worst case scenario for the Broncos, and we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about this here in a couple of weeks. Come back to the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. So you'll see what I'm talking about here. Worst case scenario is that all the quarterbacks are gone. You've got all the, the cornerbacks. Uh, so Patrick Sertan, uh, Caleb Farley are both gone. Um, Penny Sewell is gone. And you're sitting there at number nine, and you're looking directly in the face of Jamar Chase, Jalen Waddell, Kyle Pitts, and like Rashawn Slater. Like that's a, a worst case scenario for the Broncos. And we're going to break that down for you guys and, and give you a little bit more nuances to far as to how that discussion goes. And I might actually change some of that stuff up because you never know how things are like quickly going to evolve, um, especially after free agency. So it, it's, it is a, it is a conversation you need to have. It, it's something to, to bring to the table while there, that might not be a very high likely possibility of something like that happening. There is still a chance. So you're telling me there's a chance, right? The, yes, there is still a chance. Um, Eric, now, before, before sorry, we, get, before out we here, get out of here, I want to remind everybody about the – before you do the matters of business to get us out of here, um, about the competition we have going on. If you guys missed your chance to Super Chat this week, you have a chance next week where you can enter a competition to join us on the show and basically run a mock draft as the general manager with us as your scouting department. Again, you got a super chat. You have next week to do it as well. And then we'll be doing a random draw from everybody who super chats into it. The more super chats you have, the better your odds are of getting in. We'll get the list for who all came in tonight. And we'll add that and set that aside to be ready for next week. Um, so, yeah, you guys still have one more week left to enter this, enter the chance, enter for a chance to win. And hey, man, it'd be nice to put some yeah. faces to the names out there and guessing, yeah. definitely be able to get your takes out there as well as part of the show. As you, you pick as the Broncos general manager what you would do. Yeah, we're looking at uh, March 5th for that show, guys. So, uh, again, next week you have the opportunity to, to enter into the competition and hopefully get a chance to join us on, on the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. Um, and, honestly, tell us where you're from. Like, Broncos country is not a geographical location. It's the state of being. We've said that for yes, years, for months well, on, on the Huddle Up podcast just, network. Like, Just it, look at what we who we have here on this. I'm in Alaska. Lance is in Wyoming. We have somebody in Utah, somebody in Seattle who is in in uh, Iowa. We have somebody in Kansas. We have somebody in London. We have somebody in Colorado, somebody on the East Coast. We have people all over the place. Yep. It really is. Broncos it's is not a geographical location. It is a state of being. And it's all us uniting, being fans of the Denver Broncos. Yeah, look at this. We got we got somebody here in uh in Pittsburgh. We got let's go Broncos. Andrew Switzer jumping in here from Oregon. Uh Cop 16 jumping in here from New York. Uh Dylan Von Arks, one of the one of the moderate uh, Clifton Harris says on the East Coast, Dylan Von Arks, Cloverdale, California. Uh Slim Slow, Portland, Oregon. Like uh, La Junta, that's in, that's in Colorado. Like there's there's a bunch of different people from all over the world. Uh, Peter uh, Peter Middleton, one of the another Dove Valley deep diver um, super chat superstar. 
comes in from Turkey every week, and he uh, is always in on the uh, on the YouTube comments as well, saying, "Hey, good show, good show, guys. Love to see you guys." He jumps in all the time on the Deval- uh, on all of the podcasts. Everybody, I mean, there's a it's. It's not just Denver. It's not just the Colorado area. This place is worldwide. Tampa, Florida, I'm seeing here. New York, Piston Honda. Scotland. Well. I forgot. We Scotland, had somebody yeah. from Scotland say, on this day. Yeah. We've got uh, 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 Keith Cummings. He's is from Scotland. He's one of the, one yeah. of the, the top MHH uh, reporters. I mean, he does a great job. This uh, Broncos country is not a, a geographical location. It is a state of being. Mr. Boggins jumping in here from Tatooine. All right. I see you. That, I see you. It was, is, is that one your home? Is that where you live, Mr. Boggins? <laughs> All right. Now, we got a, another Super Chat jumping in here. Hold on really fast. I got to grab this. Don't, don't want to leave any of our Super Chat superstars out in the cold. Deshaun jumping in here with the $5 Super. Just set, showing some love. Appreciate that, man. And it looks like he's in Miami, according to his profile picture. Deshaun Barub. <laughs> I believe it. Don't don't murder me if I butchered your name. I apologize for that. Uh, thank you for joining us, everybody, all of you for joining us on the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. That's going to do it for us tonight. Uh, matters of business, as per usual. You guys can follow us both on Twitter. You can find me at Sanderson MHH for Eric at Eric Trickle. Also, while you guys are at it, follow at DVDD underscore Pod. That's the easiest way to keep up with what is going on with the Dove Valley Deep Divers. Also, at Mile High Huddle, that's some other account. Breaking news and analysis, uh, film breakdowns, opinion articles, anything regarding your Denver Broncos from your favorite Mile High Huddle personalities, including myself, Eric. Uh, you've got Nick and Carl, Luke Patterson, uh, uh, Zach Kelberman. Um, James Campbell drops articles every now and again. Um, we'll get Keith as well. Chad Jensen, uh, the the overlord of the Huddle Up clan, <laughs> as, as, as it may be. Uh, Mile High Huddle. You guys are going to find all of that there as well. Um, if you guys are on Facebook, Facebook supporters, go to my, uh, facebook.com slash Mile High Huddle. Become a supporter. Click the blue uh, become a supporter button to get Kelberman's Corner every Sunday at noon. Um, we're trying to get something else figured out for some film breakdown stuff for you guys. Me and Eric are um, potentially calling it the 5280 view. That might be coming out here um, probably after the draft. We'll see if we can get something worked out. It's going to take a little bit of time to get this all set up. And we're both really busy working on studying the NFL draft. Um, Guys, regardless, if you guys are not able to do anything like that, subscribe, like, and share. Subscribe wherever you guys are watching this show or listening to it after the fact as a podcast. Subscribe to Mile High Huddle. Like every video you guys see, and if you love it, share it. Also, guys, head over to huddleuppod.com. Hit the merch tent. Get yourself a hat. Get yourself a T-shirt. There's a face mask, a coffee cup, anything to suit your fancy, something for the guys, something for the gals, and you can get a onesie for your baby if you want it. So anyways, with that, Eric, before I get you to any last words, I got one thing that I want to put out there. <laughs> and uh, this is something that is obviously a hot button topic with the uh, with the Denver Broncos. Now, obviously, Deshaun Watson, probably not on the market yet, but at the same time, the asking price currently potentially sits at three first round picks, a second round pick, a third round pick, a fourth round pick, and a couple of young defensive players. Does that remind you of any potential trade early? Like that's a steep price. Remember, does that remind you of any trade in NFL history, specifically in 2017? Well, yeah, I already know that it's the uh, what the Philadelphia Eagles did would go up and get Carson Wentz, um, which I think that's actually too low for what they might be asking for Deshaun Watson. You have a chance for a shot in the dark quarterback to get up to number two, or you have a shot at a proven top five quarterback that's only 25 years old. Um, I don't think it's good, and I think that Denver should go get uh, uh, Deshaun Watson. I'm definitely in that thing. Somebody said I like Star Wars. That is definitely true. If you can't tell, Star Wars. I've got Star Destroyer. I've got an ATAT, Sebulba's Pod Racer. I've got the Twilight. Pod Racer. I've got Django Fett. I've got the Ghost. Slave One. So got to have a bunch of different ones. Richie and I. Richie Rich coming in here, and he has the greatest idea for the next merchandise item that needs to go up on huddleuppod.com. Raider diapers that a baby can poop into. I need some of those. My six-month-old son right now needs some new diapers, and I am all about it. Richie, thanks, man. We appreciate you. Um, and then Trevor, I wanted to say something to Trevor real quick uh, and to Kai and everything. Um, I work security at a courthouse. I, I'm very open about that on Twitter and everything. And uh, I was bullied a lot through school. And uh, I have security clearance to work as a contractor for a state courthouse. 
And the kid who bullied me, I see coming into the courthouse all the time. And it's not because he works there. Tell Kai to keep his head up. Things will get better. Yeah. And just yeah. it's there's a lot of reasons why kids bully and none of them are good. Don't want to get into them all of them, but hope nothing before the best, but the best for Kai and everything. And uh, if they're bullying him because he's a Broncos fan, man, then shame on those kids and shame on those kids' parents. So all you need to do is you need to tell him that uh, the Broncos still have more Super Bowl trophies in their existence than the Chiefs do. And they also have more Lamar Hunt trophies than the Chiefs do. And that's a pretty big insult to Lamar Hunt, considering Lamar Hunt used to be the owner of the Kansas City Chiefs. Now, guys, with that, we got to get out of here. Eric, any last <laughs> words? Get out of here. Are we good to go? I think we're good to go. I, oh, Richard, Rich, the lightsaber hasn't come in yet, but when it definitely does, uh, it'll definitely be all over my Twitter. I'll yeah, probably change yeah. my profile picture to have that because I love a lightsaber more than my daughter, apparently. <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> but... <laughs> Oh my God, guys. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't comment on that. I'm, I'm done. I'm out. You all stay safe. Take care. Have a great rest of your weekend. Mile high salute to our super, super chat superstars. Same time, same place next week, Friday, 6 p.m., 8 p.m. Eastern. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks. Take care.